guess we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining everybody. So tonight's read is The Other Black Girl by Zakaya Delilah Harris. So to get started, I'm going to talk about the author a little bit. Looks like we have another joiner. Hi, Wendy. So Zakaya Delilah Harris was born and raised in Connecticut. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her MFA in nonfiction creative writing from the New York School in New York City. The Other Black Girl is Harris's debut novel and was named the most anticipated book of 2021 by Time Magazine. Released on June 21st of this year, The Guardian described it as a glimpse into the publishing world and its original take on Black professional women striving to hold on to their authentic selves and their stresses. Harris pulls inspiration from Octavia E. Butler's Kindred, Toni Morrison's Sula, Nella Larson's Passing, and Jordan Peele's Get Out. A synopsis of Harris's The Other Black Girl is 26-year-old um, Excuse me, Zora, before you go on any further, would you like to introduce yourself and, and welcome, Wendy. Oh, we yes. have a new participant. Greetings, Wendy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I did, forgot to introduce myself. I'm Zora Mayo. I'm going to be your moderator for one of your moderators for tonight. I uh, chose the other black girl for us to read tonight, and I'll be helping us kind of guide our discussion. Would anyone else like to introduce themselves? Georgette, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> I am Zora Mayo's mother, Georgette Mayo. I'm one of your co moderators. Uh, for the Dr. Consuela Francis Reading Circle. And hopefully we will have our other co-moderator, uh, Ms. Ruth Rambo, who has not entered just yet, but should be joining us shortly. And I'm going to turn it on to Carlise, if you'd like to introduce yourself to our participants. Carlise, if you can unmute yourself. Sorry. It's okay. um, Car I'm Carlise Shedrick. I'm happy to be here tonight, and I just want to hear everyone's take on the other Black girl. Great. Thank you. And greetings, Pam. Hey, you Pam. can unmute yourself if you'd like to say something. Just, hi, hello, everybody. Happy to see you all. Glad Good to, to see, see you also. <laughs> and Wendy, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Wendy. Um, I love the book. It was just, it was really enlightening for me. And I just want to hear what everybody has to say about it. Great. Well, we're glad to have you. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. So for those that were not able to read it, I'm going to just, I'm going to do a quick synopsis so we kind of have a feel. 26-year-old editorial assistant Nella Rogers is tired of being the only Black employee at Wagner Books. Fed up with the isolation and microaggressions, she's thrilled when Harlem Board and Bread Hazel starts working in the cubicle beside hers. They've only just started comparing natural hair care regimens, though, when a string of uncomfortable events elevates Hazel to office darling and Nella is left in the dust. Then the notes begin to appear on Nella's desk. Leave Wagner now. It, it's hard to believe Hazel is behind these hostile messages, but as Nella starts to spiral and, the obsess, and obsess over the sinister forces at play, she soon realizes that there's a lot more at stake than just her career. A whip smart and dynamic thriller and sly social commentary that is perfect for anyone who has ever felt manipulated, threatened, or overlooked in the workplace, the other black girl it will keep you on your, the edge of your seat until the last twist. 
So I'm going to go ahead and get started with some questions. The first question is, why did the book start off with the prologue from Kendra Ray's perspective as she's fled the city? How did it set the stage for what was to come? Do you guys recall that prologue that took place back in the 80s? Does anyone want to hypothesize why that might have happened? No wrong answers. <laughs> I guess it got your uh, curiosity going. Yeah. You didn't know why she was fleeing. I agree. And, I agree. Yeah. It was a good way to start it. Yeah. I think it's always an interesting take when an author or a director, what have you, decides to get a story going from a place of discontent rather than a place from content. And we can leave it at that if you guys want to. I mean, we, we learn more about Kendra, obviously, but from there, we just know this isn't going to be a pleasant story. We know not to, you know, sit right in and be cozy with it. Oh, I think that uh, to answer, you know, uh, one possible answer to your question, Zora, is like, um, you know, her, um, Kendra Ray speaking out and saying what is her true reality as her experience as a black woman at this white dominated workplace um, is um, unfortunately like intrinsically inflammatory. Um, yeah. And it's exactly sort of what happens in the plot um, because Nella's constantly being sort of goaded to go over the edge. Um, yeah. So I think I, I felt like the author was making a statement about it being a radical act just to speak your truth as a black woman. You're absolutely right. And if you guys recall, um, Kendra did something quite daring when she was when she was called out by uh, the train conductor. When he mentions that he kind of knows her. She says, oh, no, you're mistaking me for someone else. And and that's kind of a daring move. But because she was so daring in doing so, he kind of is forced to believe her and goes along with it. And we barely know this character. We go along with it, too. And that that's the choice that we that the author decided to make as well. So another question is, Nella is the only black person in an all white environment. Let's discuss the microaggressions she dealt with on a daily basis. Were there any that you guys notice off the top of your head? Pam is shaking her head. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like the woman who, um, um, comes over I forget her name she drifts around to cubicles and she comes over and kind of kind of lays her reality out like it's you know I, I, it was sort of invasive and it was a very white perspective you know dominant hegemonic perspective um so I mean there was a lot of that going on yeah no absolutely I think also when her boss was talking to, I can't remember who she was talking to. She was in that little meeting. There was just the three of them. I think they were going on and on about how much they knew about Harlem, maybe. I'm not <laughs> sure. The two white women. Yeah. I think that yeah. was another one. Yeah. Right. And like kind of just in general, how, how uh, Nella was kind of looked at as the black resource, the black spokesman for all things black. Why do black people do this? And, and why do your people do that? And, and, and in the literary world, she was the reference, you know, for all things black. Anyone have anything else to add? Okay. When the company hires another black girl, Nella hopes they'll be each other's allies. But this, but she soon starts to suspect that Hazel is competitive with her. When did you suspect that something was off with Hazel? Uh, 
I have to apologize because I have a horrible memory. You know, okay. I just I enjoyed it and I I know exactly what you're talking about, but I can't really pull out details and um I know I was feeling bad for Nella because we saw that she wasn't gonna be the friend that she was hoping her to be, but I can't remember, you know, all those little things that started to add up when we both, me and Nella, both had to admit this wasn't going to be the friend that she wanted. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think for me, it was actually in their very first meeting and Nella went to try to get I tried to make eye contact with Hazel during a specific interaction and Hazel wasn't making eye contact with her. She was kind of enthralled with a conversation with the white employees. And that to me kind of signified that, she, that it was never gonna happen. They were never gonna have it from the, cause it was like from the very, from the get. Uh, yeah, I just, I just kind of knew from the start it was just not going to be there. I mean, obviously the book is titled "The Other Black Girl," but but still, you know, I just I just I just didn't think it was there. Anybody else? I can't recall the exact um, scene, but I kind of felt that from the very beginning as well. That you know, it just seemed like Hazel was just trying to cozy up to all the, in her mind, all the right people right from the very beginning. Yeah, I agree. And let me ask you guys this question. Did you guys dislike Hazel? How do you feel about Hazel? I thought she, she was sneaky. Sneaky? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you feel like that from the get or like did it take some some of her actions? Right from the beginning. Okay, okay. She got the assignment right from the boss to read that book when, um, that was, the, yeah, that, that was, was so pretty clever. sneaky. <laughs> yeah. That's and then she of... acts all nice, right? Like, well, I'll send it to you. She just must have, she must have just overlooked that. Yeah. And I think in the, uh, the time they went to lunch, um, that was sort of a setup for her, you know, the way that she was really sort of goading her to um, uh, make the comments uh, about the, um, the author that she was really nervous about uh, doing and showing that she was going to be uh, supportive but realizing, you know, what the impact was going to be when Nell did. Yeah. No, absolutely. Were you surprised that Nella didn't seem to catch on to Hazel's no. behavior? Hazel was, a, Hazel was an excellent con artist. You forgot, mm -hmm. and an and psychologist and strategist. She was really smart, yeah. you know. Yeah despicable but smart and tactical and she gave and and the other part is that you have to remember is Nella had been by herself so long in a hospital environment that she was starving for somebody who she could talk to and who would understand what she was trying to say no, and I like so, that you just said that. I like that you. I like what you said, Miss Rambo, when you said hostile environment. Yes. Oh mm -hmm. God, it was awful. I mean, how many how many people on the call have been the only white, the only black person in the in the white work world? I know. I know. I have. I. I, I yeah. It. It's tough. It's. It's tough. And so mm -hmm. she was, she was way ready to have a cohort, uh, you know, a compadre. She was, she was starving. You're right. Absolutely. So, so Hazel was, you know, easy to accept happily and, and 
uh, the, to the question earlier. I'm sorry to be late, but you know I have, I'm, I'm technically challenged, or as I like to say now, I am a digital immigrant. <laughs> So I had these, these technical issues anyway. Um, that is say okay. <laughs> she, uh, she, Nella, um, was eager to have somebody to talk to. And to the earlier question about when did you discover that Hazel was a snake? And, um, well, but you didn't say it that way, but that's how I heard it. Um, and it was when Vera called Hazel into the office and she had this, the script that, that Nella never got, the, yeah. the, the um, book that Nella got, never got to see. Um, she had the book and she sort of was waving it and she turned before she walked in Vera's office. She turned and she looked at Nella and the, Nella, and the look said, I beat you. I got you. Um, you know, you are now undone because I'm queen of the I'm queen of the hill. Absolutely. And that, that's when I knew she was the snake. So that was pretty early on that I did not trust Hazel, but Nella did. <laughs> yeah. So our next question is. I had just one comment. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons that Nell probably didn't trust um, or didn't catch on is that mm -hmm. she had been in sort of an isolated uh, environment growing up. So she was very sheltered. She really hadn't uh, had the exposures to have the, you know, the competition or to know these um, uh signals or, or signs and i think that that was one of the things that sort of transcended throughout her uh naiveness about uh things you know in general that she sort of lived in sort of a pollyanna type world right no I but a black but a black pollyanna right right and, and that that's a that's an entirely different animal she did have right. a certain amount of naivete but she was not she was clear that the system was not working to her advantage. Right. She was clear. She, on her did, point. She, she didn't have that cutthroat um, attitude that a Hazel would have um, yes. because of Hazel's yes. environment. That's what I was yeah. trying yeah. to say. I mean, she, mm. she, didn't, she didn't know the tricks and she right. had not really had to survive in a, in a, re her, her, white environment was not as hostile as Wagner. Right. So that I was think there were also two times, at least I remember, where she saw something that was sort of a little bit of a red flag in Hazel's behavior, but she was trying to give her the benefit of the doubt or see if there was another explanation, because I think here she was, she thought she was going to get an ally, someone who she had a kinship with, and she just did not want to give up on that. Too. Yeah. 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 And she asked her friend, she asked Michaela, and even Michaela was like, no, the, the you're, she wouldn't do that to you. Yeah. I agree. I, that's what I was thinking too. There's, she was maybe, well, maybe there's two different ways to get to the same goal. You know, that's what she was doing. That's what I thought in the beginning. And Nella was kind of questioning herself. Well, maybe I haven't. You know, maybe I should be using a different approach like she is. She seems to be getting somewhere pretty quickly. So I didn't know really as quickly as other people what she was an adversary, you know. I thought she, her motives were pure at first. <laughs> well, I, I think there is an assumption. I, I, I think there is an assumption, uh, particularly among black women, that when there is a black woman in your in your circle, that she's going to be your ally and she is your mm -hmm. sister, quote unquote, sister. Um, mm -hmm. I think there is, and and for the most part, up until maybe the millennials, that was true. That that for the most part, black mm -hmm. women would would cover their 
cohorts back mm -hmm. because um, at, socially, regardless of, of uh, color, caste, education, whatever, black women have been at the bottom of the social totem pole. So without that sister network thing, pretty much would have been, because they didn't have any allies, there were no allies. And so I think that, that also added to uh, Nella's acceptance of Hazel and, and her excusing the, the obvious, what her gut told her that Hazel was about. Yeah. Our next question is, a passage towards the beginning of the book says, diversity becomes an item people start checking off a list and nothing more. A shallow, shadowy thing that with but one dimension. What are your thoughts on this? On diversity being just a quota in the workplace. Who said that? I couldn't tell. I, th I think this was part of what Nella was trying to, trying to convey when she was doing her diversity push and when it started to waver and people weren't very interested. I think that's when that quote came about. Because she was a diversity. Yeah. I was going to say, but, but in, what do you, I thought your question was, what do you think about the concept well, of, this, of diversity training and diversity as a construct? Well, I, I am very much, um, I've, I've heard of the term diversity higher. Mm -hmm. And I will be, in, I'll be completely honest. I, I believe that that's a real thing. I believe that, you know, someone looks, will look around the room and say, you know, we, we really need to- We need some color, color in the room. Yeah, we really, <laughs> we've really been lacking here. We need to, we need to liven it up. And that in their next, in their next uh, attempt to do so, they, that's, that's what they push for. And that's where they leave it. Well, it's not only that, a lot of times it's a, it's a written mandate in yeah. protocol. So, you know, it's, it's that, that quota thing that they have to check off the list. And the diversity doesn't necessarily have to, you know, a lot of people think it's just black and white, but it can be, diversity can be somebody that's disabled. Uh, oh, Absolutely. Another ethnicity, another and, um, and another gender, and another gender. gender. Yeah, it, yeah. it's to diffuse the the middle aged middle class white male as the only person in the room, sitting around the board table. So on all levels, yeah. But this is this is this is not new. It used to be called oh doggone it. Diversity, diversity and inclusion is the new language. Equity, diversion, and, and diversity and inclusion is the new language. But back in the 60s, it was the same thing. It just had different name and I, it won't come to me. Maybe sometime it will show up. Well, do you believe that it's working? Do you, like, what do you think is going on? Is it work? You didn't actually ask that question, did you, Zora? Did you really I don't, ask that question? I, I, okay, hear me out. I'm, I'm just trying to, I, I know how I feel. I know how I feel. I just, someone might feel differently, you know? <laughs> I would well, say that I'm, a I'm, lot of, I, I would say most white people don't have a clue how enriching um, life could be if they got outside of their own sphere. And how much how how much better a workplace, or how much better a product, or how much better a, 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 an approach to life they could have, we all could have. If, like, in other words, what I'm trying to say is, it's not checking a box. It's not about checking a box. It's about recognizing what you get 
when you have a diverse workplace. And I don't think many white people get that at all. Yeah. And, and in answer to your question, um, in the 80s, in most companies, uh, major Fortune 500, 100 companies, uh, diversity education was a major, major expense. We had to go through the coursework, the training, and uh, there were applications that had to uh, take place after that. And to consider the fact that we are still now, in 2021, still talking about it as sort of this unique thing, I think that's sort of an answer that it was a card that had to be punched, but it wasn't a reality. It wasn't a walk that was actually um, enabled. It was a talk. Um, and it was a talk for uh, a purpose within, um, you know, within companies. But it did not transcend the uh, workplace uh, environment. Yeah, no, I mean, I completely agree. I. Yeah. I, I want to say, I want to go back to the thing that I was talking about earlier. I'm talking about the 60s. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking, so when you say the 80s, that was happening in the 60s. And the reason I know is I was working for the Urban League. And that's what I did. I went and did, and almost the, the word almost came to me, it wasn't diversity training, but it was the, the foremother or the forefather of diversity training. It had absolutely no impact. The people who sat in the training did that because they were required to, and it did not impact the hiring. Maybe they got, maybe one or two people got hired as a result of it, but they didn't go far. They had a glass ceiling over their heads in these companies, so maybe they got to, um, um, was no, the word, it wasn't multiculturalism. It was called something else. The multiculturalism was about the 80s, but in the 60s. Affirmative action. It was, it wasn't, the training wasn't affirmative action. Either. But anyway, the, the only point I want to make is this is this attempt to make sure that people are racially, ethnically, gender, uh, sexual orientation um, sensitive somehow doesn't work because racism and sexism are so deeply embedded in the culture you can't mm, the analogy that I've been using of late is you can't take the baking it's a biscuit and you can't extract the baking powder. There's no way to take the baking powder out of a, of, of a biscuit. It's there, it's gonna be there until the biscuit is either consumed or destroyed. Yeah. So our well, next I also question. think it has to do about the, the person. Um, I'm sorry? Whether the person is ready to hear that training or not has a lot to do with it with anything that you learn you can hear it over and over again if you're not ready if you're not ready for it so it's just like everything else so much more complicated than it appears on the surface um my son-in-law had um diversity training in the new york city board of ed you know it was great he said wow i never thought of these things you know and he you could tell by his comments that it made an impact on him, even though obviously going into it, he probably thought it wasn't necessary initially. You know, he's teaching kids of all different color, colors. So, but he, it affected him. It did. I just think it's very individual. And if you have to do it, like you said, if you're, if you have to do it to keep your job, well, yeah, it's just going to have a certain amount of success. Yeah, you have to be receptive to it at the end of the day. So our next question is actually one of my favorite topics that happens in the book, and it's Nella's boss asks for her opinion on the latest book from the best-selling author Colin Franklin. She shares her concerns about how the only black character was written, 
Both Colin and her boss gets offended and defensive. Why wouldn't they listen to Nella? And overall, how do you think that whole situation, that whole ordeal played out, you know, from the beginning, that meeting with Colin, to how it eventually ended up with Hazel? We'll start with, with the original meeting with just Nella, Colin, and Navira. I'm going to just say one thing. You know, okay. uh, it was a tremendous overreaction, obviously. He got so defensive. But she did say one thing that I thought was wrong. She said he, he could have been more creative. I mean, that's like a terrible thing to say to, you know, that was, that really cut into anything else. That's what he's going to remember. You're telling an author that he's, he wasn't creative enough, you know? I would say that was not the most tactful way of saying. Would you argue that it wasn't what she said, but how she said it? Um, overall, not the creative part, but overall in in how she chose to critique. No, the, for me character. personally, I just, no, I thought it was a big overreaction on both of their parts. But okay. that was just one sentence where she, she made a mistake, I thought. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Anyone else I, have thought? I think I think Nella made a mistake tactically, and the mistake was that she should have talked to Vera before she talked with Vera and Colin in the same room, so she could get a feeling as to whether Vera was amenable to hearing this criticism. Yeah, because yeah. Vera, I am I I cannot imagine that anybody would be this insensitive that that Vera would accept a protagonist with five and a half children, opiate, de, you know, dependent um, character, protagonist. The protagonist was wrong, but, but Nella should have talked with Vera before she talked with Vera and Colin, because she knew that Colin was, she knew Colin was gonna, you know, um, overreact. She, she, she could forget her, that. But she, she tried. Least, she did try. She no, tried. She I know she know. tried to, but I'm saying not having had the conversation with Vera when she was then in the room with Vera and Colin, she needed to moderate what she said substantially and cre being, you're right, being, telling a writer you weren't creative enough. I mean, please, do you want to stab me in the heart three times? Give me a break. Yeah, that was that was way inappropriate. Well, don't you think that she would have been a little more subtle if Hazel, during that lunch, hadn't sort of um, egged her on to really, you know, tell it like it is, and you know, yeah, yeah. I think I, that I, she I, would have been. Yeah, I think so. She too. knew her boss. That's a great she, point. She was apprehensive from the beginning about going to her yeah. and uh, stating that. And also with Colin, she knew both of their reactions to it. And I think that she, um, she would have sort of been circular in her um, conversation, you know, if Hazel hadn't sort of uh, pumped her up to go in and steamroll. Mm -hmm. No, I really mm -hmm. like that. That's I have a really different take on that interaction. I gotta say. Let's hear it, Pam. Um, what do you think? I thought she was pretty diplomatic. I hear what you're saying, but I I felt she was she start. You know what they say when you're like um, doing a performance review of an employee or whatever. You start with a positive, and then you kind of bring in. I thought she did. You know, textbook kind of started with the positive. I mean the the. The, the fact of the matter is, um, they were classic, it was quite classic white fragility. You know, sh she's there to mm -hmm. just, th she's the black woman they hired to say, you know, and they ask her for her opinion about this book and this black character, and she gives it fairly diplomatically, in my opinion. And they can't separate, I mean, where, where, when they jump from she's criticizing this character to he's a racist, I was like, what? You know, like, 
She didn't say that. They jumped to that because they, it was like your classic, white people often cannot separate, like, oh, I'm a racist. Oh, you know, I, now I have a hood on my, you know, I'm wandering around in, in white robes. No, we just said, you know, she just said, this character is not well developed. I mean, I don't know, that was just classic. Um, I don't, and yeah, and he I, totally overacted. And he, even if Vera didn't agree with her, um, she could have. She could have. Um, what's the word? Um, De-escalated things, huh. and yeah. she didn't. Yeah. Well, I also considered on on Colin's part that he was already. They had pumped him up so much, you know, from prior success to this this new novel that he's coming out with. That you know he was already like on a high saying, well, you know, he was really confident saying, you know, I know my work is good and I know my character development is good and there can't be any problems with this. But, you know, obviously he based this off of a, uh, of a stereotype. And Nella called him He was him a diva. Right, he was a diva. Yeah. Yeah, and what he did, what he said was, Colin twisted that around and kind of pushed it back on her. He's like, that isn't that great? Isn't that stereotypical of you to say? Oh man, that was that was a hard one to sit through. Yeah. So let's uh let's add in what Hazel did next. I think she... they actually even called her racist. I think Vera said, weren't you being a little racist? Yeah, I remember for, I, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think her. Her. Okay, yeah. 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 Yeah, but but then when Hazel gives her opinion in front of everyone afterwards, and gives her kind of seal of approval over over um, the character, kind of solidifying the fate of both the book and the character's presence, and also Nella's opinion not mattering and being mute. How do you guys feel about that? Well, that was very upsetting to me because if I remember correctly, it seemed like that Nella got through to Vera because afterward, didn't she ask Hazel for her opinion? And that's when Hazel threw, threw Nella under the bus. I thought she, like Vera, went and thought about it and said, you know, I know that Nella's right. Let me get another opinion on this. And then Hazel threw her under the bus. Yeah. I mean, that was true manipulation on Hazel's part. That was her job and she did it well. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it like that. Okay. So who did you, who did you think were sending those notes to Nella? What would you have done if you were Nella and received those notes? That was a real puzzle for me, uh, trying to um, figure out who could possibly, in, in the back of my mind, I wanted to say Hazel because that's, what I wanted to say that she was trying to push uh, Nell out, but I couldn't figure out who it was. You know, every time I thought I had a handle on it, uh, it seemingly went in, uh, you know, a different uh, direction. So I didn't really have anyone else as a suspect except for um, Hazel. Yeah. You know, I, I actually saw the note as being from somebody who was on Nella's side, saw the danger, and was, I thought, I thought the person was trying to be helpful. So I didn't mm. see it as being Hazel. I was thinking, um, um, there was a character in the, in the office who The male guy? DJ, I don't think it was DJ because he was gone. Yeah, he was gone when the notes were um, di distributed. Um, was he sick or broke a leg or did something? 
but mm -hmm. he he wasn't on the premises. But I I thought the notes came from somebody who who saw Nella going into a buzz saw and saw no no way out for her except to extricate herself from Wagner. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see it as being a, a hostile. I saw it as being a, a legitimate warning from for somebody who who was scared for her. And that left that, was very, a, that left very few people for me to think who it might. I didn't know who it was, but I thought of them as a friend, as yeah, opposed was, to a, a foe. That was a puzzle yeah. for us during our book club um, discussion. You know that we had several months ago, and uh, we couldn't really. You know, no one could really pin that down as they were. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thought it might have been uh, Kendra Ray. Hmm. You think so? Was she Kendra there? Ray? I mean, was she was she actually there to have that much insight into the, that that particular um, conflict or episode, whatever you want to call it? Well, we know that the actual physical delivery of the notes was by that woman Pam, right? Yeah. So it's so she was also kind of intel for what's going on in the office, yeah. even for people yeah. who weren't in the office. Yeah. Yeah. But ro role, like, I too struggle with this. I just I struggle with the roles because their characters weren't as developed. So I struggled with what roles they played. Well, nobody. The the twist, the number of twists and turns, and the identification of people at particular times I found uh taxing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised surprised that it was surprising. I was confused I'm, a lot. I'm yeah. still confused about who Shawnee was. Like I I'm still kind of scratching my head about her. Yeah. Well she comes in she comes in late and without a lot of definition. So I can I can see that. I I wish I could say something insightful about her except she too was a puzzle. As what did what did the king say in the king and I? King and I she was a puzzlement. She was a puzzlement. <laughs> it was a puzzlement. I like that. Well, kind of talking about you know the twists. The next question is: We finally learn what is behind the curtain of the OBGs or the other black girls. Hazel is part of a group distributing hair grease that works as a social lubricant. It makes black people amenable when it comes to working with white people and removes any guilt. What did you think as you read that reveal? Did you think it was an interesting plot twist or did you not like it? Really good metaphor. I thought it was so fun. I liked it a lot. And I liked um, the hardcover um, of the black girl where they have the comb and the black power sign. And so the hair thing was so fascinating to me. I loved it all. And then when they put in that, that was the, you know, social lubricant. I thought that was really clever and great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what better way to kind of, what, what better so social lubricant, you know, because that's, Black women's hair is such a, such a sensitive topic, such a deep topic, such a personal topic for us. But it was weaponized in this story. You know what this reminded me of? I don't know if anybody is familiar with the book Mama Day by oh, Gloria yes. Taylor. Oh, yes. Can you uh, kind of talk about it a little bit? I'm not familiar. Well, it's been a while since I've read the book, but it's one of my classic favorite books. And 
I'll, I'll, for all practical purposes, I'll call her the villain and the heroine. And the, the, the villain inserts this, you know, she, she says, oh, let me do your hair. And the heroine is like saying, you know, well, I don't know, but she went ahead and let her do that. And she put this hair grease in and it, basically it made the heroine ill to the point that it was, it, it was fatal. I was gonna say poisonous. Yeah. And it was set in a sea island in the low country. Yeah, it, it's the isolated island, in fact. Yeah, it predates uh, um, Dash's work. Right, but not by much. No, I remember no, reading that when, no, but, yeah. what, 30, daughters of the 30 daughter. years ago. Yeah. yeah, and I think Naylor's long since dead. She died. No, unfortunately. Before she got to re to write more stuff, she was really talented. But yes, yes, I I agree wholeheartedly. It's reminiscent of that. But the other thing that I think about, and I I tend to connect everything, um, not everything, but many African American things to the spirituals. And when I read about what the various pomades were and what they were supposed to do and how they, what parts they impacted and so forth. I thought there's a bomb in Gilead. Mm. The song just kept. And so it took, it took them someplace else. It took them to another place. It was an interesting twist without question. That passage that she um, has in the book when she talks about the memories, early memories of her mother sitting between her mother's legs yes. and the intimacy of that yes. um, loving um, care. Yes. And then to take that, you know, um, very essential mo thing um, and make it the delivery mechanism for this insidious you know, thing is, I thought it was pretty smart of her. I thought she set that up well. Yeah. I, I had trouble with the notion of the intimacy of getting the hair done because my, my experience with getting my hair done was so awful. And, and, and it's, it's in a, it's discussed in a book called Black Rage from way a hundred years ago. And there's a section in the book talking about uh, black female narcissism. And one of the things that the, these are two black shrinks. And one of the things that they talk about is what my experience was with the, the hair being done. Yes, I was captured in between my mother's knee on the ground, sitting on the floor. And my hair was very thick. This is pre hair dryers. So the hair was not dry. My mother put grease on my scalp and it was also wet and then put a hot comb through it. If, if that isn't clear to you what that felt like, that was not intimacy at all. That was horror and for me, brutality, which I had to endure. But more importantly, when she finished and braided my hair and I walked out of that, out of the room, I expected people to fall over with my gorgeousness from having endured this, you know, this pain. So I expected people to treat me like I was Lena Horne. And then I was just another ordinary colored girl with, with braids. And so I, my experience was in so different from that. I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? Somebody considered it intimate. <laughs> it was intimate art. It was horror. Oh, the hair stories we could tell as black women. <laughs> yeah. I'll yeah. leave it at that. <laughs> I have the feeling I have a kindred spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why but do you the whole, the like whole notion of having to do all of this extra stuff to look like somebody that you aren't. And that was really the beauty of the Black Power movement and Black Black is beautiful. That was really the power of it, to say, 
how you how you naturally look is and can be lovely well so yeah it's that it's that notion and it's embracing yourself as in your natural state but that was that's what was weaponized because it's the natural hair community that was that was that's more so readily weaponized than any other state because you don't in this book it's not the women who are wearing leaves that can kind of wear the hair grease or the ra relaxed haired girls it's the natural haired girls so it's the women who embrace their natural hair who are targeted mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah but hair being the hair being the the dominant vehicle yeah, under any circumstance, whichever yeah. of those concepts yeah. you want to embrace, it's a, it, hair is the is the, at the center of it. And, and the that fact being, that, yeah. And with that being said, why do you guys think that Nella decided to take it? She often complained that it was the smell was too strong. It didn't really feel like her. This and that. Her best friend, Michaela, didn't want anything to do with it because she didn't like that she didn't know what was in it. But she chose to she chose to take it and go with it. Why do you guys think that was? Well, part of it was. Do you convenient. mean at the hair party, or do you mean like <laughs> she gets transformed? But kind of both. You know, she like. Okay. She had multiple because it's it's not like a one and done kind of thing. It's something that you had to constantly use daily, mm -hmm. multiple oh. times each day. And she decided to start adding it to the regimen. But so. that was an accident. Uh, that was that was convenience. I thought her hair. She was always her scalp was always dry. She didn't she didn't oil her scalp apparently quite enough ever. And then the day that her, that she was itchy. The, she had the pomade that had been given to her was the woman's name Juanita or something mm -hmm. that Juanita had given her was in her bag and so it was a matter of convenience yeah yeah but she could have done what Michaela does she could have tried the, the products that Michaela tries she could have well, at, that, at that moment that's what she had that's all I'm saying that's so true. that's true because her head it, it was either scratch it and stay dry or use what I was just given with, with a, which she apparently trusted to be what it purported to be, which was, you know, some grease for her scalp. But there comes a point when, um, when Hazel is on, becomes honest with her and tells her what's in the grease. Did she and, use it after that? I didn't remember. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well. Ooh. And so why then? She's sipping that Kool-Aid, you know, at that point she's chugging it because she moves to Portland because of it, you know? <laughs> right. That's what I thought. She was already transformed. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I, what I fail to like, what really that, that ending really gets me is I just don't see why I failed to understand other than her taking the social lubricant. I just don't understand why she would do it. But then, you know, I don't understand why she would take the social lubricant. I don't understand that either. So there was, was that not, scene was in the kitchenette. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, the kitchenette scene. When they, when she and Hazel walked out of the meeting with that man whose name I don't remember, who had also been sort of social lubricanted. <laughs> I don't. The, the blogger or the that they were looking to do a book deal with. Oh, oh, right. oh Jesse. 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 Jesse, thank you. So they they go out of the meeting and they the two of them are in the kitchen and you remember Hazel puts her thumbnail or her fingernail into her chest and she's like I, I, I mean what I got out of that scene was I mean her she was dizzy, she was overcome. She was just worn down. I mean I think my feeling is part of what the author was trying to convey in this book was just how how wearing it has to be to speak your truth be there like be the person you are as a black woman in a white environment a black person in a white environment and this hazel was just saying like 
take the pill, drink the Kool-Aid, and all that could go away. You know what? And boy, yes. how that tempting to make yeah. your life that much easier. I mean, it's a hard, you know. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Invasion of the Body Snatchers, but at the end of the movie, the very last scene, I, I won't give anything away if you haven't, but that ending, it's the same kind of thing, I guess. That's that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, when you said that. Pan. It reminded me of the Stepford Wives. That's what it reminded me of. <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. That oh, too. yes. That's a good one, Pam. That's, I don't yeah, know the body snatcher, but that's that, better. I, the other thing I, I, I think about the ending is I have I have wondered, oh, let me quickly tell you this story. Saw an interview with, with um, uh, Clinton, and she was talking about the 18 months when she ran for president, that she spent, by her calculation, 25 days of those 18 months dealing with her appearance in, in a, a, an amount of time more than her black, her male opponents were spending, you know, they were putting on a blue suit and a red tie and going all off. She was spending this time, though I didn't think she looked like it, 25 days with her appearance. And I have been thinking for a long time now how to calculate how much of my time here on the, on the earth I have spent being a black woman. How much time have I had to calculate? When I walk in the room, I count who's there that may apparently be on my team. What's the dynamic of the room? All of it based on being black in a white dominant society. And it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time fighting. It's a lot of time thinking about it. It's a lot of time being tactical that you would not know that, that, that isn't a part of your life at all. You walk into the room, you don't anticipate what I anticipate. So it, it, excuse the pun, it wasn't intended, but it really colors how you live your life, how you think, and everything. And, and that, the end of it made me think, yes, submit, surrender, just give it up, because you, you, you're not going to, you're not going to change it. So be in it and relax and, and take your time back and, you know, knit a sweater. That, wow. That's really where I, where I was at the end. Ms. Rambo, that was honestly beautifully put. I ne never thought of it that way, but wow, yes. Yes. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll get more answers with the Hulu series. Uh, this oh, there's a Hulu a, series. Uh, a TV program. It was picked up. Oh, yes. Was picked up. Wow. Yeah. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tune in. Provocative to say the very least. I'm one, I'm wondering about casting personally. Uh, so. Oh, yeah. who did you see as Nella? And what did you think of the name Nella? Nella Larson. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking okay. of which, Passing is going to be picked up on any on I think Netflix too. The Nella, yes. the Nella Passing, because there are two of Nella them. Larson's Passing. Nella yeah. Larson. Oh, really? Yes, it's Who's going to do it? I think it's next um, month. Yeah. yeah. Do they have Nella? Do they have they have the cast? They do. Oh yes. Yeah. Let me look it up real quickly. Oh, good. You can Make look sure on I'm... YouTube. There's a lot of interviews with the cast and the director. The director has a very interesting story, a backdrop okay. story. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you so very much. I didn't know that. Any final words or any any further comments about thank you guys for just an amazing discourse. I, this was very good. This was very, very good. But those, that's all I have to say. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank great you. job. Um, thank, thank you, you all. for, um, yeah, I was very happy to um, participate and hear everybody. It was well, great thank you. Me. Welcome. Come back. Yes. Yes, Please thank you, back. everybody, for coming. Just before we part, I want to promote and mention our upcoming November and December, we're gonna be having guest speakers in conjunction with the Black Ink 
uh, of Charleston African American Book Festival, which is coming up on in January 13th to the 15th of 2022. November the 11th, we're meeting a little bit earlier because of the holidays. So we're meeting a week earlier. So November the 11th, we're hosting Dewana Brockington, who writes paranormal um, books. And her book, The Rise of the Millennial uh, Witch, is a combination of three of her previous books. Mm, okay. So it's a, a trilogy. And on December the 9th, we're hosting Ms. Beverly Jenkins, the historical romance author. And she asked, she's requested that we read Topaz. So we're hopefully we're looking forward to having everybody join us. And Absolutely. we didn't get to give a shout out to the people that came a little, just a little late, but we're glad that you joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Thank you. we look forward to seeing you hopefully next month on November the, the 11th.